This is the day the Lord has made. We should rejoice and be glad in it. That's what the psalmist wrote. Let's see if we can do that. All right? I'm going to open us with a word of prayer, and then we're going to start um, singing with a song we've done before. And it's one of those songs, it's called Revelation Song, and it's based on the, the words that are written in Revelation about the worship that's going on in heaven uh, A, yesterday, tomorrow. So a, a foretelling, a future of what we have. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful song. But anyway, let me start us with prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for today. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your watch care. Thank you for your strength. Father, we've gathered to worship and I pray, Father, that through all the elements, your name will be glorified. Our hearts will be encouraged and praised. And thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for that we're here. Let us now enjoy this time of singing and the prayer and the giving and the message. Uh, Father, use those things for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stand up. If you'd like. Stand if you can. Sit if you need to. It's on heaven's mercy seat again. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on. Heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothed in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is our Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Oh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. 
with all creation I see praise to the King of Kings you are my everything and I will adore you please be seated since the time of its inception the church has suffered persecution. Many of the men and women around the world who choose to follow Jesus do so under the threat of persecution. It may look different in various places, uh, chastisement, a lost job, run out of town, run out of your family, imprisoned, or even death. As IMB Emeritus missionary Nick Ripken states, don't you ever believe there's a free church and a suffering church. There's just the church. God has called us to pray for the persecuted church. We stand with persecuted believers because we are all members of the same body. Sunday, June 6 has been marked as a day of prayer for the persecuted church. We invite you to join with thousands of other Great Commission Baptists in prayer for persecuted believers around the world. Please join us. Welcome, church family, friends and visitors. If you are new here, we would love to get to know you. Whether you are participating in person or online, please complete a Connect card. When you are here in person, you can find the Connect card in the back pocket of the chair in front of you. Just leave it in the offering plates next to the door when you are leaving. Online you will find the link to Connect card in the upper right or under the three little menu bars on the top left. These will still be available even after the live stream ends. Just be sure to scroll down to the bottom of the card and click on Submit. For those who are online, particularly if you don't type messages in the chat, please use the Connect card to let us know you are here and doing okay. In person or online, the Connect card is a great way to send in questions, comments, or prayer requests. If you know we already have all your connection information, just putting your names is enough. Thanks for helping us to help you. Now let's join together in worship. I'm going to invite you to stand if you can, sit if you need to. These next three songs have to do with the fact that we're hoping that you're saved. This next song says, your grace is enough. You know, the Bible teaches there's nothing else we need to do except be saved by His grace. And then we're singing a following song, an old hymn, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. You know, stepping over the line of salvation is not the end of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're to follow the way of the cross, the way that Jesus tread. Third song is a, is a wonderful uh, song that I heard, gosh, 40 years ago, but it's a beautiful, I heard it, but a quartet used to sing it, that, that were, were uh, part of CBC, which is now CBU. But they went on tour. But it's now I belong to Jesus. That's the ultimate goal, to belong to Jesus. Your grace is enough. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. Wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy, and nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead 
us in the song of your salvation and all your people sing along so remember your people remember your children remember your promise oh god your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough for me your grace is enough heaven reaching down to us your grace is enough for me your grace is enough i'm covered in your love your grace is enough for me
Once I was lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Joy floods my soul for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he gave to redeem. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Amen. Please be seated. Morning, church family. How are you? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that uh, wonderful worship. Um, I am part of the mission team here at First Baptist Street, First Street. Anyway, uh, I'm, I got, <laughs> we're Baptist too. Anyway, um, as you can see, the logo's up on the bulletin board or the projector screen. Um, will be the local missions that I'll just briefly give you a, a little bit of information about. Um, the team has decided that this month there are seven ministries that we will support. So I'll present two of them to you today. And each week, you'll get an, another one of the team members presenting the mission team designation for our month of local missions. So everybody, all your mission uh, donations this month will go towards this. The Salt Mine is an organization here in Lincoln. Many of you may have heard of them because they have the salt cellar, but they also have a food bank. And that food bank, I have some um, literature here I'll put on the back table. It's in Spanish and English. For those of you who want to have more information, they provide food baskets at, for those who qualify. And they have a, a faith-based organization. So if you donate to Rayleigh's at the food um, donations, or if you are part of the donation collection for the Boy Scouts, they will get that food. And residents of Lincoln and Sheridan will get those food baskets. Uh, so they have to sign up and, and um, qualify for that. The other organization is the Christian Encounter Ranch, which is up in Grass Valley. And it is an organization for young people, 15 to 24 years old. It's a residential program that is faith, Christ-based, and they provide services to help these young people change their lives, turn them around through Christ. Praise the Lord. And they have um, scholarships there for their residents. And they would give us a tour if any of you are interested in doing that. And we can also have someone come and speak about the program. But right now, we'll continue on. I want you to continue to pray for our local missions this month. and. Throughout the year, we'll be presenting other uh, mission opportunities that we can reach Lincoln, Sacramento, and the United States for Christ. Thank you. Amen.
we take time to pray. I'll lead the prayer time. Pastor Michael, close the prayer time. As uh, God leads you, please feel free to pray and let us begin. Lord, again, we are grateful. We recognize, Father, that you are the creator of all living things, the creator of this universe, the creator of us as individuals. Father, you know us. The Bible says you know the number of hairs that we have on our head. Even when that changes daily, Father, you still know. You just know us that well. We know our needs before we ask. Thank you, Father, for your knowledge of us. Unfortunately, that sometimes does make us a little antsy. You know the good and you know the bad. And yet, Lord, you still love us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your power. We lift up to you this church, Father, its people, its presence, its finances, its future. Just pray, Father, you be in the midst of drawing people here and leading them to participate with us in ministry to this community. Thank you for this time that we've been worshiping, and we will continue to worship through this prayer time and the giving and the message to speak Pastor Mike as he shares your word this morning. Thank you, Father, that we can approach you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you, Father, for what you do. We praise you this morning because you are worthy of our praise. You are God. You are wonderful. You are our creator, our sustainer. You supply every need of our lives, Lord. We lack for nothing that's really important. We have food, clothing, and shelter. We have uh, the very air that we breathe. But mostly, Lord, we have you because you have loved us, because you have given yourself that we might be purchased, that we no longer live under the burden of sin. But, Lord, we live because you have given us life. Thank you, Lord, for these blessings. Lord, we do lift up our country. I, I just, uh, I think today, June 6, 1944, where countless lives were lost in the preservation of liberty. Lord, I, I just think about that uh, all the time, of people who sacrifice their life, life so that we might enjoy the freedoms we enjoy today. But Father, you gave your life in Christ that we could have eternal life. And we need to remember that every day of our lives, Lord, that you bought us, that we are yours. And so we give you praise for that, Lord. We rejoice because we are no longer buried under the burden of our terrible sin. But we have been set free. And we thank you and praise you for that. I lift up the pastor this morning who needs you because he is broken. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning. Aren't you glad to be here? Now, how do I know that? Well, see, now there's an expression of joy. There's an expression of love. There's an expression of happiness to be in the presence of God. This ought to be a morning where you come into the house of God and you say, I have an expectation. And my expectation this morning is I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see him right here. I'm going to see him in the praises of his people. I'm going to see him 
because I know in my heart that he loves me and cares for me. So this morning, I hope you come expecting to meet with him. Because if you don't, then why are you here? Amen? Why are you here? If you brought your Bible this morning, I hope you open it up. And if you didn't bring a Bible, there's one in front of you. You can open it up to Galatians 5.22. And as soon as you find that, we're going to read it together. Now, we may sound a little different because there are different versions of the Bible here. But they all speak the same truth. So look, if you will, at Galatians 5.22. It's a familiar passage of Scripture. Most of you know it and can say it by heart. But in my old age, my memory is failing, so I'm going to read it too. Of course, nobody's memory is failing except me, right? Yeah? Except for Leo, who's nearly as old as I am. Here we go. Galatians 5, 22. Read with me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah to that, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Notice it doesn't say fruits. It says fruit. All of these things are wrapped up in that fruit. Everything. If you have the fruit of the Spirit, all of these things are apparent in your life. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I love this passage of Scripture, and it makes me do a little self-examination every time. How about you? Am I exhibiting love, joy, peace, patience? Am I doing any of that? You know, when my wife says, take out the trash, am I patient? Am I loving her in a sacrificial way when I just get up and do it rather than sitting there and say, well, when this program's over? You know, it's a good, it's a good thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a thermometer, isn't it? Tells us where we are. We need to think about that. You know, if, you, if, this, if we wore uniforms as Christians, the fabric of the uniforms of a Christian would be made up of these things. You know that? That there's an expectation that uh, when you're a believer, there are some things that the lost ought to be able to detect about you. You ought to put off the, uh, the aroma of fresh fruit. You know, my wife and I, we planted an apricot tree when we first moved in uh, to our home. And uh, that's going to be, what, five years ago plus. And uh, when we did that, we didn't experience any fruit off that tree uh, until this summer. And I was thinking, boy, somebody gave us a bum tree. But we had that apricot tree. And this year, I will tell you, those apricots, I'm used to these little apricots, right? In fact, my grandmother had an apricot tree, uh, and there were so many apricots on that tree, we used to have apricot fight, fights. But we never had an apricot fight until the apricots were really mushy. You know, when you're 10 years old, it's okay. But these apricots were huge. And they tasted so good. And you could put them up close to your nose, and you could smell the aroma of those apricots. Oh, it was so good. It was so good you could, you could just start salivating when you heard those, tasted those apricots. On the other hand, my son brought home I don't know how many lemons from my granddaughter's lemon tree. And Jane juiced them, and I think she got about, what, five or six gallons of, vapor, of uh, lemon juice off those lemons. And in the refrigerator, she had a pitcher of this freshly squeezed lemon juice. And my son came home and thought it was lemonade. That's right. 
he poured him a glass full and he took a drink and I, I wish I'd had a camera at that moment. But here's the thing, you see, when people see a believer, they expect that sweet aroma, that wonderful taste of that fresh apricot, that sweet, juicy, indescribable taste. And when they see a Christian and they get a taste of lemons, that's about how they feel. And that leads to the, uh, the rejection of that fruit. Now, both of those fruits come from a tree, right? And they both have a purpose. But a lost world has an expectation that when they see a believer, uh, they're going to be wonderfully blessed. And they, if you will, spit out what happens when they bite into a lemon Christian. Now, when people visit in church, they want to see joy. They want to see people who are rejoicing because God has forgiven their sin. You know why? Because deep down, those unbelievers know that they're guilty. They may say, no, I'm not a sinner, but they know deep in their heart that they're guilty of sin. They can't escape it because the Holy Spirit of God continues to poke his finger in their heart and tell them that they are guilty. And so we can tell them that, but we can tell them that with the love of Christ. And it can come across as sweet spirit rather than just this terrible, bigoted, rejection. Now, over the next nine weeks, we're going to take each one of these pieces of fruit and we're going to use it as a jumping off place. So Galatians 5.22 is going to be the foundation, but we're going to, we're going to take each one of those and we're going to start today with probably the most important one, which is love, right? And so we're going to uh, we're just going to take each one, love, peace, patience, joy, all those. And we're going to see where we go by the end of this. So I want you to, if you will, while you've got your Bible open, turn to 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to read the whole first 10 verses. And uh, we're not going to spend all our time on those 13 verses. We just don't have that time. But uh, we're going to start there. Uh, The apostle begins, and I will show you the most excellent way. I love that, don't you? The most excellent way. See, excellent is superlative. But he says, most excellent. That's like a superlative superlative. That's like gooder and gooder. The most excellent way. Look at here. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels that have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. And then he gives us that definition. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy it. Does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they'll cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. I want to stop right there. 
and let you know that what he's talking about here, friends, is he's talking about the qualities of Christ himself. God is love, right? Isn't that what the scripture tells us? God is love. And if God is love, then we have to look at love. If we have to look at Jesus himself, then what we're going to see in Jesus is all of these qualities of love. Causes us to think, doesn't it? How do I fit into that? So let's take a look. Beginning in verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I want you to know first it's if. If. If I even speak at all. If I do anything at all. If sets up a condition, doesn't it? There's always an if then. Isn't that right? Remember your 7th and 8th grade English classes? Yeah? A conditional sentence, if this happens, that happens. So it starts with if, if I speak at all. And then that, that huge condition, that word. You remember when you were a kid and you always heard if from your parents? And it was like, oh, well, that's done. If, if I do what I'm supposed to do, if I speak, then he gives us the subject of that sentence. What's the subject? Come on. What's the subject of that sentence? No, it's not. If I, if I, so who's he talking about? Talking about Paul, right? If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, right? But I do not have love. If I decide to speak, if I decide to give a message, if I decide to do anything, but I do not have love, then what? I am the same as a what? A noisy gong. A noisy gong. I can articulate the truth in the most lunar, learned way. I can have the best argument to talk about Jesus. I can speak even in the patois of the local culture. But if I don't have love, if I do not express it, not just in love, but if I do not express it from a heart of love, do you understand the difference? If my motivation is not to love that person, it's just so much words. It's as though I were speaking into the wind. Greek puts it this way. I become a kalkos ikon. I become a brass basin. You ever heard the sound of a brass basin? It has no melody. It has no pleasing sound. It's just noise. And that's what he says. When you speak to a lost person, and it isn't out of love, and it isn't with the compassion that Jesus would have, then what happens? That person just kind of turns you off. You're just being noisy. If it comes from a, a requirement of speaking rather than the motivation of love, it's just noise. It may just fall on their ear. Now the blessing is that God can take even that and he can use it in a powerful way. But you're the one who misses the blessing. You're the one who misses out. That's what he says, right? I become just a noisy gong and a tinkling single symbol. That uh, that word for tinkling is lalo. Think of a little baby who's learning to talk, and they just go around la 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 la. Odd infinitum, right? 
Ask any mother, she'll tell you, he drove me crazy. Because it's just noise, just babbling, right? You see any little two-year-old kid and la 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 ba 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 just noise. And that's what's heard. If it doesn't come from a heart of love, from a motivation of love, the same motivation of unconditional love that prompted Jesus to give his life for you and me. I may have the truth. I may speak the truth. But it's just noise. We need to know that we're speaking in love. People need to hear the message of Christ. But they need to hear it from hearts that are overflowing with the love that Jesus gave us. Otherwise, noise. Second verse, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and I have, not, I have a faith that can move mountains but I have not love, I'm nothing. I'm interested in that. If I, can, if I have the gift of prophecy, we're going to talk about that in a minute. And I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. In other words, it says, I know, I understand, I get it. I can fathom all these mysteries. I can, I can deal with it. But I, if I don't have love, people don't want to hear it. You know, the thing that happened, you take guys like Billy Graham, you know, you could tell, I, I met him, and you could tell that he just loved people. He just loved them. Didn't matter. I, I saw him interact with what we would call beggars. Smelly. Homely. Druggies. Scarred with their abuse. And out of him, I saw the most incredible compassion and love. <clears throat> it's easy to love one another, right? Because we're all the fish that were cleaned. But the ones who weren't, it's kind of harder to love them. So we need to consider what motivates us. Again, you see the word if. If I have the gift of prophecy. In other words, I can preach. I can tell people. We need to look at the context of this sentence. Remember that Paul is speaking to a particular people. He's speaking to Gentiles. He's speaking to the Greeks. Most of these people lived in uh, Corinth. This was the church in Corinth. You know that uh, in Corinth there was a temple to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And in that temple there were a thousand prostitutes. I can't even get my head around that. How do I get that out of my head, right? Thousand of these women just being used for the pleasure of people. And he's speaking to them. They're idolatrous people. And he says, I, if I preach to these people, if I have the gift of prophecy, prophetes, or prophetia, really, you need to think of the city of San Francisco. It's a port. Into that port come people from all over the world, of every persuasion, of every ethnic background, of every religious background, of every ism and schism that you can possibly think of, of any idolatrous practice people come into the city of San Francisco and they pour their cultures out into the city and people receive them. And the next thing you know, you have all of this stuff going on. 
That's the kind of place that Corinth was when Paul was speaking to them. He says, I want to I have the gift of prophecy. If I can tell these people, if I can preach to these people, well, this word prophesia can mean several things. It can mean forthtelling or foretelling. You get the difference? If I'm telling forth, I am communicating, I am preaching, I am speaking out. If I am foretelling, then I'm talking about the future. And in order to get what he's talking about here, we need to look at 1 Corinthians 14, where it says, 14.3, Everyone who prophesies, same word, prophetia, speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. So here it's used in the sense of foretelling, not foretelling. It's an important distinction. He is telling the believers that they have an obligation to speak out the truth, but they need to do it how? In love. Good, you're with me. Thought I was going to have to wake somebody up. They are to speak the truth in love, right? That's what he's saying here. He's telling the Greeks and us, you and me, that the gift of prophecy or if you will, the gift of proclaiming is a gift of proclaiming the gospel, the good news. It's meant for the building up, for the strengthening, for the encouraging, for the comforting of the saints, but also for those who are hurting, who are depressed, who are lonely, to lift them up. What greater thing, what greater gift can you give than the gift of the gospel to somebody that's in the pit. You're extending them the ladder that helps them get out of the pit. You're helping them to grow and to know Jesus Christ. Yeah. Isn't that what we're talking about? We say this church is about showing his love and telling his story. You can't show what you don't have. So if you're going to show love, you got to have love. And love is a great motivator. Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12, it was he, Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's work, people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That name apostolos means someone who is sent, somebody who has a mission from a greater authority. In that sense, yes, some are given to be apostles, but if you know Jesus, if you are a believer, then you have an obligation to share the gospel. Does that make sense? If you know Jesus, you're, you're commissioned not in the same sense as Paul or the same sense as John or Peter or any of the other 12, but in the sense of one who is being sent on a mission. You have a mission. You have an obligation. And you need to carry out that obligation in love. You know, it's like a parent asking a kid to do something and they go down the road kicking rocks and say, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to enjoy it. But if God commissions you on a mission to be his ambassador, what greater calling could you possibly have? And let me tell you, you may not want to hear it, but I'm going to tell you, you are an ambassador to your family to your friends, to your neighbors, to the people at the grocery store, to the ones at the gas station. You are an ambassador to every lost person so that they will come to know Christ. You know, in, in that context, I, I believe that it means one who is sent on a mission for the king. Are you? Are you sent on a mission? Do you have an obligation today? 
You might examine your heart and say, Lord, are you sending me? Don't ask the question if you don't want to know the answer. Of course the answer is yes, he sends us all. Look, Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Then Jesus came to them, and he said, All authority is given and in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now, if you look at verse 16, you see the context. He's talking to the who? The disciples. Now, if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, and he has given you a new life, let me ask you this. Are you a disciple? Or did you just buy fire insurance? You see, if you really know Jesus, then you are a disciple. You're a follower. You're a learner. He teaches you through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit commissions and sends you. And he sends you in love, in the love of Christ that Christ has given you, so that you can give that love as a gift to whomever you encounter. There is no greater gift than hearing the gospel. Now, whether or not the gift is received is not your responsibility, but your gift, your, your commission, is to give the gift. You understand? You make sense? All right, we're Baptists. Let me hear you say this. Amen. Amen. Okay, so do you understand? Yes. Oh, that was rather anemic. Let's hear it again. Do you believe what I just told you? Amen. Amen. Okay. Then you know you have a commission. You know you have a purpose. You and I. Do it again. Joyce. Do it again, Joyce. Does your life plank? Amen. There you go, Joyce. Thank you. So here's the thing, you know, you, none of this is going to take place without that critical element. None of this is going to take place without that love of Christ that he gave to us, that unconditional love that we all have. We have an obligation to the hopeless, the suffering, the sick, the lost, to give them in love. And without that love, Paul says, I, that's personal. I become just a gong and a tinkling symbol. We wonder sometimes how we can be in that position. You've heard the story about the widow lady who was destitute and she was a believer. She loved the Lord with everything in her heart. And every day she would stand at a window and she would pray, Lord God, please provide for my needs. I need groceries. I need my bills paid. And you know I'm, I, I don't have any income. Lord, please, please, please help me. And every day she would stand in her window and she would look at the sky and she would pray to God. And every day the man who lived above her in the apartment above her would hear this lady praying. The unfortunate thing, thing was this man was an unbeliever. And he was a cantankerous drunk. And he would listen to this lady, and it just made him mad. Day after day after day after day, he'd hear the same thing. I need groceries. I need my bills paid. I need you to take care of me. Lord, what am I going to do? And he, he just hated hearing it. So one day he says, I'll fix that. So he went down to the store, and he bought her all the groceries. And he left them on her doorstep. And sure enough, the next day she's standing in a window and she's going, Lord, Lord God, thank you so much. Thank you for meeting the needs of this poor, desperate woman. Thank you for caring for me. Thank you for the groceries. Thank you for all the things you do to me. And the old man leaned out the window and he hollered at it. You old idiot, I'm the one who bought the groceries. And out of her mouth came, Lord, thank you so much for providing for all of my needs even though he used the devil to do it. <laughs> Here's the point. You can preach the gospel out of a cold heart. But if God takes that and uses it to bring somebody in the saving grace and knowledge of him, and he may have used the devil to do it. 
and the blessing is that the, the gospel is preached. It's much better if you preach the gospel out of love. And I hope and pray that's where you are. Some people are going to share the gospel like this old guy, this old devil, who tried to make light of it. But some are going to preach the gospel like this fellow Arthur Hinckley, a teenage kid. Some, di some time ago, he lifted a 3,000-pound tractor with his bare hands. He wasn't a weightlifter, but his friend Lloyd Belter, age 18, was pinned under the tractor in a farm near Rome, Maine. And hearing Lloyd scream, Arthur somehow lifted the tractor enough for Lloyd to wiggle out from under it. You see, the power of love and care can do mighty things. It can move mountains. It can change people's directions. I'm not so sure, but whether changing people's direction is harder than moving a mountain. But here's the question to you this morning. Out of a heart of abundant love, the love that Jesus gave you, are you willing to be the instrument that lifts the load of sin off of someone who is perishing? Are you willing to commit your life to love in that incredible love so that others can know Christ? It's up to you. You know, in your bulletin somewhere, there should be a question, two of them actually. The first one is, what is God saying to me today? And the second is this, what am I going to do about it? To not answer is to answer. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we come into your presence, we come broken people. We're all messes, Lord. We're all broken. We're all people who struggle. We're all people who are sinful. And yet, Lord, you loved us. You, you loved us incredibly so much that you gave your life for us. For this morning, Father, help us to give that same love in the form of your gospel to somebody else, that they can know Jesus, that we will experience that fruit of your spirit. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together in this time of commitment. We're going to have a song. And if God is speaking to your heart, and I can help you in any way, then please come and let me pray with you. Or there are people around you, you can turn to them and ask them to pray for you. Because Jesus loves you a great deal. Amen? Let's sing. Oh.
Till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. We are so grateful to all of you for your faithful giving. You are enabling the outreach activities and facility improvements which are now being planned. Please always complete a Connect card whether here in person or online. Come pray in person, or put Zoom on your Connect card to receive the weekly link. Know anyone who is food insecure? Please tell them that the Salvation Army will be back on June 9. The Reynolds are inviting you to a potluck lunch at their home on June 20. Directions will be on the back table on that day. Information and sign-ups to help on July 4 are in the foyer. There are invite postcards on the back table. Please keep inviting others. Thanks. Now, you know that uh, 4th of July is going to be a, a big thing for all of us, so we need all the help we can get. Uh, please take a look at the sign-ups that are, are there on the back table or in the kitchen. They're on the kitchen counter. So uh, please, if you can, uh, give us a little assistance. Uh, we just need people to uh, interact with our guests who will be out in the parking lot shooting off their fireworks. And uh, we need somebody on fire watch and just in case that... Uh, something gets away and we have to uh, wet it down a little bit. But uh, there's a lot of things that you can do to assist. So uh, some of them only take a little bit of energy, some take a little bit more. So each of us doing a little uh, will get the job done. And the, the biggest job is to connect with our people. Connect with the people who are around us. Let them know that they are loved so that we can tell them about Jesus. Amen? Okay. Uh, please stand. Thank you all for being here today. Welcome to our guests. I'll, I'll try and catch you before you get away. Some of our guests just hit the road running. My goodness. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Praise you because you are our God. You are the one who created us and loves us. You're the one who made us. Lord, thank you for every blessing. Thank you for the things that we often take for granted, the air that we breathe, the roof over our head, the food in our mouths, the jobs that we have. Thank you for all these things. And Lord, as we leave this place, help us, help us to show your love and tell your story. In Christ's name, amen. amen.